Okay, so this is part two for my alien spaceship three. I'm in my room and the sun is going down and I had to turn the light on. So I want to talk, I want to clear this up about the ending of time. I think this is very important that people don't misunderstand this. And I see a lot of people misunderstand this under the Jiddu Krishnamurti videos. And it is important to explain what he means by ending of time. So obviously he means that we need to become aware that psychologically time does not exist. So that's the ending of time for us as in a form of real realization that psychological time does not exist and never has existed. So in the sense of ego, in the sense of... And I have to get into the details of this and Jiddu Krishnamurti and David Bohm and other people that, that were talking to him, they never really got into the details. You know, as they always say, the devil is in the details. And because it is important to explain it in details, in a practical way, like from our daily existence, you know, we can't just keep it theoretical or in an abstract way talking about this in an, in an abstract way. David Bohm understood what Jiddu was talking about, but then the audience doesn't understand it. They don't follow us. So I'm trying to put this into my own words as good as I can. The ending of time means there was never time in the sense of psychology. Uh, in the sense of our perception of existence. So there is time in a, in a very measured, incrementally determined way that people have created, beginning with Galileo, measuring the movement of a circle with the, the shadow that the with the sun that casts into the tower and the sun beams that casts onto the floor in the tower of the Vatican. Okay, so and then then the sun beams the sunbeam projection onto the floor moves and he drew a circle on the floor and then that sunbeam moves gradually in a circle. And so he created this sort of measurement in this. So then they could start to, because before they would just go like, oh, the sun is going down, let's go to sleep, right? And they will say, I meet you tomorrow at the, at what they call dawn, okay? So when the sun goes up, when the sun first appears above the horizon, and uh, and people are woken up by the sunbeams, so then they know, okay, now I'm meeting whoever I'm meet meeting. But that was never really accurate. Yeah. So they would just be meeting very casually. They would go over to a place and maybe the other person is already there or the other person is sleeping longer and comes later. So with, the, with a more determined measurement of the sun going down around in the circle of the Vatican, creating a clock out of it, then they could create increments in time, and that is measurement in a pragmatical way. The problem occurred, as Jiddu Krishnamurti pointed out, is when people start to to use time psychologically. Like when people say, oh, I have an assignment tomorrow at the university. I have to give a presentation, okay? And it's gonna be tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. 
uh, in this particular auditorium and I have to be prepared and I have to give a lecture on the olfactory system, the nose, the, the entire system of, of smell perception. And now I'm thinking psychologically in time, oh, you know, okay, we have to separate this. I have to, I have to know that I, that lecture starts at 4 p.m. and I have to know time for that purpose and I have to have my Casio clock to look at it. Luckily, my professor never <laughs> had me do this. I'm just saying this theoretically now. The, all the other professors had me do a, a presentation and I chickened out. I ran off, okay? So... <laughs> Because, also because, I use time as in a psychological sense, you know, I, I didn't only use it in a pragmatical sense. I went like, oh, my assignment tomorrow for Psychology 1 or whatever, you know, in that auditorium, he wants me to give a report on his books and so on. And I studied his books, I did the report in writing. I typed it on the computer, I printed it out in the printing room. I went over to the lecture when the lecture was finished. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, ooh, I'm sorry, oh, I got laid. I guess the, the, the hour is already over and the professor was kind of mad and he didn't understand. So I had to explain to him I have psychological problems. <laughs> you should understand you're a psychologist after all, right? I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but I was kind of like, okay, pragmatical. Yeah, I have to be there at, let, let's say, 3 p.m. in that auditorium or that seminar room. Okay. My brain goes, ah, yeah, we know now. That's where we all, this entire body here, has to go. With my assignment papers and so on. And then my ego says, let's extend that a little bit. So we just end up getting there at four. And the ego is very tricky with this you know the ego uses time then in a psychological sense and says oh i'm extrapolating what if i get there what if i get there at three and then i have to give this lousy presentation and then all these other people i don't know how, how many people were there like 15 people in that seminar but still way too many people for me at that time so and i thought what if i stutter yeah. I mean the, the idea of stu now I'm not so afraid of this anymore but at that time I was absolutely terrified I was like 30 and I was absolutely terrified and the other guys the other people they were 20 and I felt already old I felt already like I'm supposed to be doing this much better now because I am 10 years older than they are and I felt kind of you know, I felt all the psychological, you know, like I felt insecure about me being 30 and them being 20. And that was really not a problem at all. But I made a problem out of it. And I certainly didn't look even, I didn't even, I look like 18. I'm not kidding, you know. So, but I made a problem out of this because psychologically, we make problems out of things, even time, you know. So, and then we create a psychological problem with time when time really psychologically doesn't exist, you know. It is a fluent thing. It's not, it never stands still, okay. So then we panic at this assignment appointment. 3 p.m. Oh my gosh, I have to be there. I have to give a presentation. And then I, I drive myself into so much panic that I end up there at 4 p.m. The professor is disappointed. He finally had to give that very, very presentation which he was hoping someone else could do. 
And I said, but here is the written paper. He said, I don't want it. <laughs> I wanted you to give the the the, the, the actual in-person presentation, you know, with the overhead projector and all of this. And and de and explaining that verbally in details and all of that, what he was talking about and about Noam Chomsky and all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't even, yeah, I did this all mechanically. I, I wasn't even on board with what Noam Chomsky and my professor were saying. So. <laughs> It didn't even make that much sense to begin with. If it had made a whole lot more sense, then maybe my passion would have taken over and then I could have forgotten about the the psychological time idea of I have to be there at 3 p.m. So then I could have probably, as I am now, I let my passion take over things and then I um, I say... You know, who cares if I stutter? Who cares if I have a booger come out of my nose or a wrinkle or a jitter, jitter, jitter effect <laughs> on my double chin or something? You know? Who the heck cares? Okay, if people care, then they 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 got some issues. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I I'm not gonna make this a problem. You know, I I'm not gonna worry anymore what other people think, and if if I sort of alienate someone, I am me. I have my psychological issues. It is what it is. Other people have issues too. I'm not the only one in the world who has psychological problems and mental illness. Well, that's pretty obvious, right? Yes. I mean, the whole world suffers because of that, because of all these different variables of mental illness, these different variations of mental illness, forms, okay? Greed, you know, ego, self grandeur, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. So, Luckily, I don't have those. I have other issues. I have nervousness, anxiety, tension. I have presentation fear, all of these kind of things. You know, I, I'm hyper self-critical, those kind of things. And I need to tell myself, that's BS. I need to, I need to dissolve the, the self-criticalness and I need to focus on what I'm passionate about and speak freely about these kind of things that I am interested in, that I figured out for myself, that I'm excited about my artwork and so on. Yeah. And then I can, in that moment when I'm excited, in that moment time doesn't exist in terms of psychological time. You know, So it was only necessary for me, and now at home here, I don't even, need time as measurement either. I can make this video any time I want to and it doesn't matter if it's 5.36 p.m. as it is right now or exactly 5 p.m. You know, it really doesn't matter. So I don't even need time at all here at home. Right? This is great and I can make a video and if I delete the video the hackers can probably still see the video which I think they, they can because they have already leaked something out about this already way in the past. And then I was like, oh, that, was, that was already a couple of years ago where I thought, oh shit, they see everything, you know. Even if I, I put my computer offline, you know, it's not on the internet. The 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 wireless antenna is turned off so as i'm making i also don't want the radiation of course and i have it on my lap so but you know now i know this is all being recorded there's already that that on on this this the the assignment bar i can see you know two images two squares that are on top of each other with an arrow that points down so it's obviously 
it something is already downloading you know i'm just recording right now but something is download so it's already downloading this was all of my errors and nervousness and ocd rituals and, and if i decide oh no this there are too many ocd rituals in the video <laughs> I had to turn this off and start over, right? Then the hackers can still watch this video that I had deleted. <laughs> and then they laugh about, ha ha, look, she's deleting her videos, you know. Like, why? Bro, because I'm nervous. <laughs> because I'm hyper self-critical, okay? So now this kind of leveled itself out now. <laughs> so in a very, very roundabout way, those hackers, those spies, are actually helping me psychologically because now <laughs> I'm public all the time. It, it wouldn't matter what I'm doing. You know. I feel like, you know, I, and I think even when I turn the computer all the way off and I close the lid and I even turn the power off, that blue light there on the computer is still on. Then I already investigated the computer, the whole computer, to see if there's a camera somewhere on the outside. I'm getting paranoid now, okay? So I'm sure that there is an external microphone built into it, into these Chromebooks, right? I mean, whoever infiltrated Google has already made sure that they have this external microphone built into it. James Bond type of <laughs> bug and uh, now they can listen in <laughs> what I do in my bed right yeah that's like super interesting somehow <laughs> I don't know why it's so interesting I'm just an animal this is not that interesting <laughs> But now this whole situation kind of, it leveled it out to the point where it wouldn't matter what I do. It's, you know, I can delete the video. They still see the video. So I'm, I might I might just as well keep the video, right? <laughs> so I better make the video correct in the first place, right? In the very first attempt. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes I delete it. Because obviously not all people are spying on me. Not the whole world is spying on my computer. There's, I don't know, I think there are about 10 men that are that have a spy program in there. And maybe the number of people is going up gradually because my computer is slowing down more and more and more and more. Okay, so it just slows down more and more and more. And the hacker will never admit it. The hacker will say, that's your, your delusional... We're just reporting back what you talk about already in public, in your videos. No. <laughs> no, they have leaked stuff out that I have not talked about in my videos, that I have not been writing about on the internet. Okay, They have leaked stuff out that I wanted to keep private for sure, you know. And I'm not even going to talk about <laughs> Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is so incredibly embarrassing, all of this. But but then again, you know, I am an animal. And we should not be ashamed about this, you know. I have hormones, you have hormones. We have different hormones, but we have hormones, okay? So please grant women their hormones and stop calling them loose or slut, okay? We are animals just like you, okay? People, you know, they make men, make, they make the woman into some kind of alien or something. Man, we are of the same species, okay? Oh, man, this is so... But anyway, let me get back to... <laughs> Jiddu Krishnamurti, the ending of time, okay? So, 
let me use another example as psychological time definitely extrapolating into the future you know I worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and all of this or what's going to happen in 10 years what's going to happen to this country with global warming you know all of this is basically psychological time of course when we go back to statistics and like Eduard Pestel for example making predictions in the 80s on global warming and what's going to happen in 2022 right he predicted they predicted accurately what is happening today absolutely accurately they didn't even i don't even think they had this blue mind computer at that time at all they didn't they those computer systems were very bulky and very rudimentary at that time in like in 19 84 or something when they wrote that research paper that became a book Eduard Pestel and, and another person and I forgot the title now but but it was definitely about their economics work on and their statistical evaluations and extrapolations in that sense time was used again in a in a standard way in order to to bring across a scientific work in order to even science you know psychology becomes a scientific study subject field because of statistics if we didn't have statistics psychology would still be something that like more like philosophy you know something very fluent and it is but it became a social science field because of statistics because of the 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 standardization of incremental measurements you know in terms of the x and 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 the y graph and and the evaluations of you know testing different people putting them into feeding them into this coordinate system they show up as dots okay so is there a correlation between <sighs> let me use some very simple example is there a correlation between intelligence and height of the body? The, I may I made this up, but these are the kind of things people are studying. Okay, they put this into a coordinate system, and if there is a graph that is diagonal, they have a positive correlation. They'll see ah, it does, it is. So here we see, you know. The taller someone is, the higher is their IQ. I, I doubt that is the case. But people study this kind of stuff. I talked about this at the other house. The hackers probably found that video. That very politically incorrect video. I had to delete it. Because I thought, this will never be understood in the right way. Okay? So this will always be misconstructed as something else, as something bad. <laughs> I don't even want to say the word. So you know there were there was an Oriental man from I I don't I think from Japan. He he wrote a research paper. He published it. It was full of statistics. Guess what people did. They banned it. They didn't want to know the truth. They didn't want to know the statistical evaluation. No, that hit too close to home. No, no, we don't want to know it. We don't want to know the truth. It's inconvenient. It hurts the ego. He got in s under so much fire for his truthful, very, very dedicated scientific work. I think they even they they 
wrote him death threats. I mean, it's unbelievable. I don't know what happened to him. There were there are global warming scientists that they got death threats. One of these people committed suicide because of it. Okay. Here's a glimpse of what ego does to our society. Take that into consideration and meditate on this for a moment. Put this video on pause and meditate on what I just said. Ego can snowball into, into a collective, into, uh, into a society, ego, hate, war, one group against the other, one group against one person. Very dangerous. And it's happening right now as we speak. Right now. Right now. With Black Lives Matter, with the Muslim agenda. They draw the snowball in more and more unempowered people. They stick to it l like glue. They want unempowered people. They tell them they are unempowered. They tell them that they are nobody until they join that group. And people believe that. And then they join the group and then they feel like so somehow they are they they equate that with their whatever, with their 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 sense of self worth and, and so on. And it's exactly reversed actually. The more you adhere to a group, the more you act out of unempowerment. That's not empowerment. That's not power. Power is if I go to that 3 p.m. assignment of my professor and give the presentation, that's power. I wasn't empowered. Okay? I let my ego take over, my ego in terms of, I'm too scared, I need to, I need to extend the time and act like I didn't notice it. The ego does all of these things. Very unconscious stuff that the ego does. It's all ego. Ego is trying to protect us, right? My ego tried to protect me from giving a, a presentation. Empowerment is I go to that assignment, I give the presentation. In the moment I give the presentation with stuttering and everything in it and jittering and whatever. That's empowerment, okay? That, that, that the stuttering, the jittering, that, that will fade away. That will go away in time. As we get used to this situation, it will get better. It won't get better if we duck away. And I've done that for a very long time in my life. For very, very long. Okay. And I don't want to do that anymore. I have some I have something contribute to contribute to the world. Okay. If I silence myself out of ego fear and stuttering fear and all of this, how can I contribute? my thoughts to the world. I can't, right? So that's what Jiddu Krishnamurti means in terms of in terms of psychological time. You know, we extrapolate into the future. Fear of the future, you know, of whatever, you know. I'm making a video, I'm making a video, I'm making a video. Don't say anything, or I have to. Do, if I if you say something, you don't want your voice in it, then I have to turn everything off. So, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, I needed to clear this up now. Okay, so that's what he means. It means psychological time. Okay. Of course, time exists in the, in that sense that things are flowing constantly churning that's the infinite cosmos is constantly churning nothing is stagnated nothing is stagnant okay nothing is linear okay there's no linearity what does linearity mean linearity means 
means a fake standardization of something. Everything in science is is just a, these are tentative approaches to figuring things out. And in the, in and in, in order to approach or figure things out, they have to somehow measure it, and then in the moment they they bring this standardization measurement into it, they are already in a linear mind space, okay? So, but of course it's necessary in order to build something and, and in order to get some kind of sense or comparison, you know, as in statistics, we have to have that. But ultimately, it always is functioning in a very linear way, in a very standardized way. Existence itself and perception and everything, without that idea of standard, and without the idea of I have to explain what tree this is, that's an oak tree, this oak tree grows to this size and whatever. I just look at it, they use this as an example, Jitu Krishnamurti and David Bohm was with Dr. Parshari, who was talk, these three were talking about this, and they said, and and Jiddu, Jiddu said, if I look that look at that oak tree, why do I have to measure, right? Why do I have to? The moment I start to say, oh, this is an oak tree, I've, I've already limited my perception of that tree. If I sit there and I just look at the tree for what the tree is. There is no title necessary. The, the tree doesn't need to, a nation. The tree is not interested in your nation. The tree just happens to be in the United States or Oregon. The tree isn't interested in it. The tree is just interested in growing. Okay. If I calm down my brain and I get away from thought, thought in terms of measurement, psychological measurement and psychological time then I can see the tree for what the tree is I can feel the tree okay there's a flow in it I can touch the tree I hug trees I feel trees I rescued trees from oak disease and from from cedar disease and stuff I know how to do this. I'm a green witch. Okay, so. And it's wonderful. It's not scary or anything. So it's really, really great. And for that, I had to feel the tree, you know. So I want to bring up another example from the book The Horse Boy by. Rupert Isaacson, an English writer and, and journalist, and he he created an amazing documentary film with the same title, The Horse Boy, about his son, Rupert, his son, oh, his son Rowan. His son Rowan ha has a form of autism, and he did all kinds of things with his son and in order to help him heal holistically. And out of these out of this holistic healing journey came the book and the documentary film. Unbelievable. Oh, oh, oh. I highly recommend to people to watch that documentary film, The Horse Boy. I cried rivers through the entire book. Fantastically written. And through the entire documentary film. And often, people are often kind of like a little bit disappointed about a discrepancy between a book and, and the movie or documentary film made from the book. Sometimes it's not very much in tune with each other. Not, it's not always in tune. But this was in tune. Okay, the book was extremely exciting and his documentary film was equally exciting and it was exactly like the book. 
I already pictured all of this, what I read in the book that I saw then in the documentary film. I pictured all of this in in very in very palpable details. Even that's how good he is as a writer. Rupert wrote about a man in England. They called him a shaman. You know that this word the Native Americans don't want anyone to to use that word. So I don't use that word for that reason, because someone said that it's really bullshit. But I I will I said okay okay bro, I won't use that word anymore. I'll say energy healer. Okay, but he used the word shaman. He, he said that. So I'm I'm gonna say energy healer. There was an energy healer, or is an energy healer, in England who rescues horses psychologically. A real horse whisperer. And he asked that man, he met with him, he said, how do you do this? That man was able to heal race horse, horses, broken bones. You know, he, he, w he would go over there and in just a few days, these, these fractures would heal. And Rupert went over and said, how do you do this? Give me, give me an explanation on how you do this. You know what that energy healer said to him? He said, he said, Rupert, it's called love. That's what he said. Love. It's love, Rupert. Rupert, it's love. <laughs> and... So Rupert never forget that he had to write about this in his book. So what does it mean? You know, I see some people on the internet they don't really understand it. So Jiddu Krishnamurti said, "Compassion is really a mystery. You know, love is compassion. It's very powerful that there is a power in that in compassion that exceeds anything else." anything else anything okay people who try to come into the occult with an egoic mind state or a trollish type of mind state they'll never achieve they never achieve they're not in that territory they can't see it they don't know what it is so they will never achieve that level because of that they can i know some people can do some people can do astral journeying and with an egoic mind state and all that kind of stuff. I have already experienced this. I talked about this in my video. There are some people in the chat room that are doing this. And a lot of them. And I see them. <laughs> I see their faces at night. And what I see is extreme despair okay the buddhists call it krage the aborigines have a, have a symbol that looks like this like a cloth that represents the same thing krage or they also call it hungry ghost the hungry ghost is in total despair the hungry ghost comes is a stagnator soul, but they never stagnate, of course. That's just my my name that I gave them. They come from the stream of sorrow. They, they are new souls. They don't know how things work. And they're in despair, of course. Of course they are. They attract what they are coming from in their everyday life. They attract the very mother they come from that also comes from the stream of sorrow. All of this is always an energetic match, and they seem to never get out of that loop, okay, of suffering, of krage, of wanting, of being hungry and thirsty, you know, thirsty ghosts, hungry ghosts. And they are in despair, they are in despair of childlike naiveness. And out of that, as I said many times before, out of this comes a sexual perversion of of desiring a child which goes completely against evolution this has to do with this with with the ego and with that enormous human convoluted 
need and and suppress to suppressing of that need suppressing they suppress their their physical desires religion added enormously to this okay. so that's why you know question question society question religion question everything you have been told you know this is the truth i'm telling you okay you must question it philip you have to question your religion okay very 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 important 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 i love you okay please believe it i care about you okay i see you i see your suffering philip i see it okay i'm here for you you know I'm here for everyone. I'm the mother of all beings, okay? <sighs> that energy healer, he goes into the horse barn, he sits with the horse, and what does he do? He gives that horse undivided attention. I am here for you, baby, you know? That's the energy. I give that energy to my horse. I give that energy to all animals. When the squirrel was hit, I was absolutely amazed about this. I, w I was shaken for weeks after that. We, we drove down the haunted highway, the, the 299, on the way back home. And, and I say, oh, there is the squirrel. There's a squirrel in the middle of the road on the, on the right lane that we were driving on. And Paul saw the squirrel. We stopped. I got out. We blocked the traffic behind us so that people wouldn't. He put the, those emergency lights on. And I went over to the squirrel and I, I inspected the squirrel. The squirrel was bleeding. There was a puddle of, of blood under him. And the squirrel was sitting there like in total shock with the hand up like that. But like almost paralyzed, sitting there, trembling like this with eyes wide open like in total fear and shock over what happened. So someone hit that squirrel. Someone caused internal injuries, okay? And I didn't know what to do. I, I, I didn't want to hurt the squirrel. I didn't want to cause any more problems, you know, if there's a fracture or anything. So what I did is I put my hand on the squirrel, very lightly, my right hand. very lightly and I gave the squirrel undivided attention I cried with him I said I'm here for you my sweet sweet thing so soft so soft that that cold that winter cold I could feel the blood under my hand and guess what he did he closed his eyes when I had my hand on him like I could sense some kind of sigh some kind of there was an energetic relief, like, thank you, thank you, thank you, whoever you are, for putting your big hand on my, on my back. And he could, he could relax a little bit, you know. And so, and Paul said, we need to bring him, bring him over to the side. So very, very carefully, I put both of my hands under the belly and I carried the squirrel over to the side. And I wanted to wrap him into a blanket, hold him on my chest and bring him to a wildlife rescue place or a veterinarian. 
and and Paul made a fuss about this as you can't use this you can't you, we need to get the, the the best we need to get a better towel and, uh, and as I was looking for the towel the squirrel made it down walked slowly down that slope like 15 feet down to a tree and then he he sat there next to that tree and he was moving around slowly and looked to me like the squirrel was already recovering oh my gosh i was so glad when i saw that you know so but we were both totally shaken up but i tell you the power the power of unconditional love that radiates out of your body you cannot imagine it's infinite that power is infinite that's healing power okay and there was someone in my family from my mother's lineage who was able to do that as well an uncle of hers who was helping people, who was helping POWs in Germany with the healing touch in, in the hospitals. Quite something. My parents are both very skeptical, but they t told the story anyway, and I'll never forget that. You know, I register those kind of things. So, this is the truth. It works, you know, but the magic behind it is, is very simplistic. It's love, Rupert. Yeah. It's love. That's what that energy healer said. And it is very difficult, as Jiddu Krishnamurti said, for people to feel this love, to, this compassion. It's very difficult to get into that rearm to get into that energetic state of mind when people are obsessed with their own ego and their image their self-image with when they're obsessed with a nation belonging to a nation belonging to a football team a basketball team belonging to a religion okay it's so all based on the same principles, dualism, okay. ego identification. Okay. In that moment, they can't feel compassion. It's impossible. They are, they are too occupied with, with their idea of self and, and social acceptance. How can they feel this other being? How can they feel, how can they feel their girlfriends okay. in that moment? They can't. So I hope I sorted this out as good as I could, which I tried. You know. So I will talk more about this in my future videos. You guys take care. Bye-bye.